Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. When you review these uh, slides on placental endocrinology. So um, to begin with, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Ina Crisologa from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. I'm with the Division of Maternal and Fetal Medicine um, in the department. And so for the next 45 minutes, we will go over placental endocrinology. So placental development is a highly regulated process that is essential for normal fetal growth and development and maintenance of a healthy pregnancy. The placenta fulfills several critical roles as the interface between the mother and the fetus. It prevents rejection of the fetal allograft. It enables respiratory gas exchange, transports nutrients, eliminates, eliminates fetal waste products, and secretes peptide and hormone and steroid hormones that regulate both maternal metabolism and fetal growth and development. By now, you may have had exposure to the normal anatomy of the human placenta. Like many of us, I am a visual person and tend to lean towards what I can see with my eyes. The physiology and endocrinology of the placenta are just as important because for what may seem as an inconspicuous organ, in comparison to what an actual human fetus beside it is, it is fascinating how much goes on at the cellular or molecular level. So please join me for the next uh, 45 minutes or so as we try to dissect the endocrinology of what goes on in the placenta beyond what is seen by the naked eye. Who is in charge of the pregnancy? Is it the mother or her fetus? From the vantage point of an outsider looking in, it seems as if the mother is in charge. But from the fetal point of view, it is overwhelmingly logical that the maternal adaptations of pregnancy are controlled by the fetus. For the fetus, one of the crucial aspects of intrauterine life is its dependency on the effective exchange of nutritive and metabolic products with the mother. It is logical that mechanisms exist by which a growing fetus can influence or control the exchange process and hence its environment. The methods by which a fetus can influence its own growth and development involve a variety of messages transmitted by hormones. Hormonal messengers from the conceptus can affect metabolic processes, uteroplacental blood flow, and cellular differentiation. Furthermore, a fetus may signal its desire and readiness to leave the uterus by hormonal initiation of parturition. The placenta is not innervated, and hence any communication between it, the mother, and the fetus must involve humoral agents. The signaling molecules secreted by the placenta can act locally through paracrine and autocrine regulation. They say that the production of steroid and protein hormones by human trophoblasts is greater in amount and diversity than that of any single endocrine tissue in all of mammalian physiology. So that must be quite amazing. So here is a diagrammatic representation of some of the hormones that are interchanged between the placenta and the fetus. A compendium of average production rates for various steroid hormones in the non-pregnant and in the near-term pregnant woman is shown in this table. It is apparent that alterations in steroid hormone production that accompany normal human pregnancy are quite incredible to say the least. Estrogens and progesterone are produced by the placenta. Aldosterone is produced by the maternal adrenal in response to the stimulus of angiotensin II. Hydrocort hi sorry, deoxycorticosterone is produced in extraglandular sites by way of the 21 hydroxylation of plasma progesterone. Cortisol production during pregnancy is not very markedly increased, even though the blood levels are elevated because of decre decreased clearance caused by increased cortisol binding globulin. Steroidogenesis in the fetoplacental unit does not follow the conventional mechanisms of hormone production within a single organ, as you may have learned from your other subjects. Steroidogenesis results from the critical interaction and interdependence 
of separate organ systems, which individually do not actually possess the necessary enzymatic capabilities. Let's start off this slide by saying that trophoblasts refer, if you recall your uter uh, uterine or pregnancy anatomy, are the peripheral cells of the blastocyst, which attach the blastocyst to the uterine wall and become the placenta and the membranes that nourish and protect the developing embryo. The outermost layers of the blastocyst that attaches the fertilized ovum to the uterine wall and serves as a nutritive pathway for the embryo are the trophoblast. This is also called trophoderm. It is helpful to view the process as consisting of a fetal compartment, a placental compartment, specifically the syncytio trophoblasts, and a maternal compartment. Separately, the fetal and placental compartments lack certain steroidogenic activities. Together, however, they are complementary and form a complete unit that utilizes the maternal compartment as a source of basic building materials and as a resource for the clearance of steroids. This busy slide just shows you the many, many proteins associated with pregnancy. You have some that are produced at the fetal compartment, at the maternal compartment, and mostly those that are produced within the placental compartment. The human placenta synthesizes an enormous amount of protein and peptide hormones. This includes nearly one gram of placental lactogen every 24 hours, massive quantities of chorionic gonadotropin or HCG, adrenocorticotropin, ACTH, the growth hormone variant HGHV, parathyroid hormone-related proteins, PTHRP, calcitonin, relaxin, inhibins, activins, and atrial, nitrite atrial nitriuretic peptides, to say the least. In addition, there are various hypothalamic-like releasing and inhibiting hormones, such as your thyrotropin releasing hormone, your gonadotropin releasing hormone, or your GNRH, your corticotropin releasing hormone, your CRH, somatostatin, your growth hormone releasing hormones, your GHRH, just to name a few. And some of these we will go into detail over the next several slides. So as already, mentioned, the placenta is a very important endocrine organ responsible for the release of hormones into both the maternal and fetal circulations. The hormones produced by the placenta can be split, split into two categories, the placental steroid hormones, which are all derived from a common precursor, cholesterol. And then you have the more numerous placental protein or placental peptide hormones. So let's look first at placental steroid hormones. Progesterone, something that by the time you finish your rotation in obstetrics and gynecology, you will be able to know it by heart, maybe in your sleep. So before I go into the um, details about progesterone, let me talk about placental steroid hormones for a bit. The main site of production of the placental hormones is the trophoblast of the chorionic villi. The steroid hormones comprise a group of molecules all derived from a common precursor, cholesterol. Steroid hormones are lipophilic molecules which are protein bound in the bloodstream and can then readily cross the bilipid membrane of cells. When these hormones bind to their intracellular receptors, the specific complex formed has a high affinity for nuclear binding sites. They then alter the genetic activity of the cell and thus alter biochemical events, affecting their necessary functions. If implantation occurs, resulting in a pregnancy, the developing blastocysts will then begin to produce HCG or the human chorionic gonadotropin and res rescue the corpus luteum, which is now the main source of your progesterone production. After six to seven weeks gestation, very little progesterone production is in the, occurs in the ovary. And thus, surgical removal of the corpus luteum or even a bilateral oophorectomy before the seventh week may result in a miscarriage unless an exogenous source of progestin is given. 
after approximately eight weeks, the placenta assumes progesterone secretion, which then continues to increase such that there is a gradual increase in maternal serum levels throughout pregnancy. By the end of pregnancy, progesterone levels are said to be 10 to as much as 5,000 times as those found in non-pregnant women. Most of the progesterone produced in the placenta enters maternal cir circulation. At term, progesterone levels range from 100 to 200 nanograms per milliliter and the placenta produces about 250 milligrams per day. Most of the progesterone produced in the placenta enters maternal circulation. So this graph here on the right shows you how exponential the production of progesterone is. And that is probably the main reason why pregnancies are maintained up to term because of the increase in the levels of progesterone production. Progesterone is synthesized from cholesterol in a two-step enzymatic reaction. First, at the mitochondrial level, cholesterol is converted to pregnenolone in a reaction catalyzed by the cytochrome P450 cholesterol side chain cleavage enzyme. The pregnenolone, as will be shown in a graph in later slides, then leaves the mitochondria and in the endoplasmic reticulum is then converted to progesterone. And this process is catalyzed by the three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Progesterone is then released immediately through a process of diffusion with maternal plasma cholesterol being a necessary agent. Even though the placenta produces a prodigious amount of progesterone, there is limited capacity for trophoblast cholesterol biosynthesis. It necessitates using LDL cholesterol for its production. This graph on this slide now shows you the various components of what takes place in the fetal, the placental, and the maternal compartments in the eventual production of progesterone for utilization by the fetus. Radiolabeled acetate is incorporated into cholesterol by placental tissue at a slow rate. The rate-limiting enzyme in cholesterol biosynthesis is your 3-hydroxy-3-methyl-glutaryl coenzyme A reductase. Because of this, the placenta must rely on exogenous cholesterol for progesterone formation. Helligin Associates in back in 1970 found that maternal, maternal plasma cholesterol was the principal precursor as much as 90% of progesterone biosynthesis. The trophoblasts preferentially use LDL cholesterol for this progesterone synthesis. In studies of pregnant baboons, when maternal serum LDL levels were markedly reduced, there was a significant drop in placental progesterone production. Thus, placental progesterone is formed through the uptake and use of a maternal circulating precursor. This mechanism is unlike the placental production of estrogens, which rely principally on fetal adrenal precursors. And you will see that in slides later on. So what is the role of progesterone in maintaining the pregnancy? Basically, these are the functions. Progesterone is necessary for the maintenance of a quiescent and a non-contractile uterus. The hormone has anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive functions, which protect the conceptus from immunological rejection by the mother. Initially, Progesterone is produced by the corpus luteum in order to prepare the endometrium for implantation of the conceptus. At around 35 to 47 days post ovulation, the placenta takes over progesterone production, what is now called the luteo placental shift, and the levels are sufficient to solely support the maintenance of pregnancy. 
maternal cholesterol is a substrate for progesterone synthesis and the 3 hydroxysteroid dehydrogenous enzyme is the rate limiting step. Interestingly, the progesterone has no relationship with fetal well-being as contrasted to the role that placental estrogen plays, and thus progesterone levels may persist even after fetal demise. Progesterone concentrations are higher in pregnant women over 30 years and lower in multiparous women and smokers compared with younger women, nulliparous, and non-smokers. Progesterone also serves as a substrate for the fetal adrenal gland production of glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. The metabolic clearance of progesterone in pregnant women is similar to rates that found in men and non-pregnant women. During pregnancy, the plasma concentration of 5-alpha dihydroprogesterone disproportionately rises due to synthesis in the syncytiotrophoblasts from placenta-produced progesterone and fetus-derived precursors. Thus, the concentration of this progesterone metabolite to progesterone is elevated during pregnancy, although the mechanisms for this are not defined completely. Progesterone is also converted to the potent mineralocorticoid deoxycorticosterone in pregnant women and in the fetus. 30 to 40 percent of progesterone is secreted as metabolites in the urine, the feces, and the bile of the pregnant woman. The concentrations of deoxycorticosterone is strikingly higher in both maternal and fetal compartments. The extra adrenal formation of deoxycorticosterone corticosterone from circulating progesterone accounts for most of its production in pregnancy. So let's move to the other very important hormone during pregnancy. And this is estrogen. Estriol is the form of estrogen produced in greatest quantity during pregnancy. Estrone and estradiol are derived equally from fetal and maternal precursors. During pregnancy, estrone and estradiol production are increased by about 100 times over non-pregnant levels, while estriol is increased by about a thousand fold. Estrogens are secreted primarily by the corpus luteum and by the adrenal cortex, as well as the placenta. HCG stimulates the synthesis of estrogen in the placenta, where the syncytiotrophoblast produces it in large quantities. However, the placenta alone is not capable of estrogen production de novo, as it cannot hydroxylate C21 steroids at the 17 position. The maternal and primarily the fetal bloodstreams that perfuse the placenta are the ones that produce dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate or DHEAS, which serves as a substrate for estrone and estradiol. And 16 hydroxy DHEAS serves as the substrate for estriol. Large amounts of DHEAS are secreted by the fetal adrenal glands and are then converted to estrogens in the placenta. Placental production of estrogens are higher when the fetus is female and this increases in a linear fashion to term. The placenta produces huge amounts of estrogen using bloodborne steroidal precursors from the maternal and fetal adrenal glands, as mentioned. Near term, normal human pregnancy is said to be in a hyperestrogenic state. The amount of estrogen produced each day by the syncytiotrophoblast during the last few weeks of pregnancy is equivalent to that produced in one day by the ovaries of no fewer than 1,000 ovulatory women. So can you imagine how much estrogen that is, even if you're to think abstractly? 
the hyperestrogenic state of human pregnancy is one of continually increasing magnitude as the pregnancy progresses, terminating abruptly after delivery. During the first two to four weeks of pregnancy, rising HCG levels help maintain the production of that estradiol in the maternal corpus luteum. By the seventh week, more than half of estrogen entering maternal circulation is now produced in the placenta. Studies support the transition of a steroid milieu dependent on the maternal corpus luteum to one dependent on the developing placenta. The pathways of estrogen synthesis in the placenta differ from those in the ovary of non-pregnant women. Estrogen production in the ovary takes place during the follicular and luteal phase during the interaction of theca and granulosa cells. Specifically, androstenedione is synthesized in the ovarian theca and is then transferred to adjacent granulosa cells for estradiol synthesis. Estradiol production within the corpus luteum of non-pregnant women as well as those in early pregnancy continues to require an interaction between these luteinized theca and the granulosa cells. In the human trophoblasts of pregnancy, neither cholesterol nor progesterone can serve as a precursor for estrogen biosynthesis, and thus a crucial enzyme necessary for this process, steroid 17-hydroxylase, or your 1720 lyase or your CYP17 is not expressed in the human placenta. Consequently, the conversion of C21 steroids to C19 steroids as obligatory precursors of estrogens is not possible. Although the C19 steroids, which are your dehydroepiandrosterone, your DHEA, and its sulfate, the DHEAS, often are called adrenal androgens, these steroids can also serve as estrogen precursors. It was found way back in the 1950s that there was an exceptionally high capacity of the placenta to convert appropriate C19 steroids to estrone and estradiol. The conversion of DHEAS to estradiol, however, requires placental expression of four key enzymes that are located principally in the syncytial trophoblasts. First, the placenta expresses high levels of steroid sulfatase, or your STS, which converts the conjugated DHEAS to DHEA. DHEA is then acted upon by 3-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 to produce androstenedione. Cytochrome P450 aromatase then converts this androstenedione to estrone, which is then converted to estradiol by the 17-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, making it now available in the maternal circulation. DHES was found to be a major precursor of estrogen in pregnancy. It is secreted in enormous amounts by the fetal adrenal gland. It is converted to 16 alpha hydroxy dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate, or your 16 alpha OHDEAS, in the fetal liver. DHEAS and 16 alpha OHDEAS are then converted in the placenta to estrogens. These are your estradiol, or your E2, and your estriol, or your E3. The large amounts of DHEAS in the placenta and its much longer half-life uniquely qualify it as a principal precursor for placental 
estradiol synthesis. There is a 10 to 20 fold increase in the metabolic clearance of plasma DHEAS in women at term compared with that in men and non-pregnant women. Thus, by showing all these graphs and the quick discourse I mentioned, estrogen production during pregnancy reflects the unique interactions between the fetal adrenal glands, the fetal liver, the placenta, and the maternal adrenal glands. Near term, half of your estradiol from the fetal adrenal DHEAS and half from the maternal DHEAS are now available. 90% of your estriol in the placenta arises from the fetal side, whereas only 10% actually come from other sources. And it is said that estradiol is a primary placental estrogen being produced by the woman by the time the woman has reached term. Now, what are fetal conditions that may result in reduced estrogen production? So this is a laundry list. Several fetal disorders may alter the availability of the substrate for placental steroid synthesis. Fetal death is followed by a striking reduction in levels of urinary estrogen. In anencephaly and fetal adrenal hypoplasia, there is diminished availability of C19 steroid precursors. Sulfatase deficiency precludes the hydrolysis of C19 steroid alphates, sulfates, which is the first enzymatic step in the placental use of circulating pre-hormones for estrogen biosynthesis. In another rare disorder called the fetal placental aromatase deficiency, androstenedione dione cannot be converted to estradiol and the androgens derived from the DHEAS causes virilization of the mother and the female fetus. In trisomy 21, known more commonly as Down syndrome, there is inadequate formation of your C19 steroids in the fetal adrenal glands. In fetal erythroblastosis, on the other hand, estrogens in the maternal plasma are elevated above normal, probably due to increased placental mass. Due to hypertrophy. So as mentioned, and I think that was a typographical error on my part for not editing the slides properly, fetal erythroblastosis is a condition which, on the contrary, does not produce reduced, but rather increased estrogen production. Other factors that can affect placental estrogen production include the following. Glucocortico treatment, glucocorticoid treatment of the mother. These inhibit ACTH secretion causing reduction in placental estrogen formation. Quite straightforward. By decreasing the secretion of its precursor, DHEAS. In pregnant women with Addison disease or other adrenal dysfunctions, there is a decrease in the estrone and estradiol since estriol is contributed more by the fetal adrenals. In cases of complete H mole or choriocarcinoma, which comprise gestational trophoblastic disease, there is no fetal adrenal source of C19 steroid precursors, so that placental estrogen formation is limited to the use of the precursors from the maternal plasma. From progesterone and estrogen, we go to the third steroid hormone, the group overall called glucocorticoids. They play a crucial role in the regulation of organ development and maturation. 
However, fetal exposure to excessive maternal glucocorticoids may cause growth restriction and can lead to problems such as hypertension in later life. Please take note that the placenta itself does not synthesize glucocorticoids de novo, but the placenta serves to regulate the exposure of the fetus to, glu to glucocorticoids by certain dehydrogenous enzymes which may catalyze reductions or oxidation of your glucocorticoids. Now let's move to the next category of placental hormones, your placental peptide or your placental protein hormones. So this is a diagrammatic representation, which many of you may be familiar with. You have your outer lining of trophoblasts, which is really the main source of most of your placental hormones. You have your inner lining of cytotrophoblasts, and this is where your developing embryo will be. Of course, we know that the maternal, uh, the syncytial trophoblast and the cytotrophoblast exist in a space where there is much vasculature, okay? Because that helps now bring it to the maternal circulation and that's where the transfer can take place. Human chorionic gonadotropin. So this should roll off your tongues very easily, HCG. By the time you rotate and fit or finish your rotation in obstetrics and gynecology, you will know that HCG is one of the most um, common hormones that you need to be familiar with. It is called the pregnancy hormone. So this so-called pregnancy hormone is a glycoprotein with biological activity similar to luteinizing hormone. And these both act via the plasma membrane LH-HCG receptor. Although the HCG is produced almost exclusively in the placenta, it is also synthesized in the fetal kidneys. Other fetal tissues may produce either the alpha or the intact HCG molecule. And so, because it is exclusive, almost exclusively produced by the placenta, even when it may not be visible yet, the detection of HCG in the blood or urine is almost always indicative of pregnancy. So let's look at the more molecular structure. So HCG, as we know it, and as mentioned already earlier, secreted by the syncytial trophoblast into the maternal blood is a glycoprotein with a molecular weight of 36,000 to 40,000 Daltons. It is the highest carbohydrate content of any human hormone, approximately 80%. And this carbohydrate content, especially the terminal sialic acid, is what protects HCG from catabolism. The 36R plasma half-life of intact HCG is much longer than the 2Rs for your luteinizing hormone or your LH. The HCG molecule is composed of two dissimilar subunits, the alpha and the beta. They have their respective amino acid components. They are co non-covalently linked and are held together by electrostatic and hydrophobic forces. The isolated subunits are unable to bind to the LH receptor and thus lack biological activity. So they really act in, co in coordination with each other. This hormone, the HCG, is structurally related to three other glycoprotein hormones, your LH, your FSH, and your TSH. And so later on, when you rotate in the clinics, you will realize that this structural similarity is what plays a role in the various pathologic conditions that can arise where you have elevated or dysfunctional levels of your um, placental peptide hormones. The amino acid sequence of the alpha subunits of all four glycoproteins is identical. In contrast to the beta subunit HCG, which have different amino acid sequences. Recombination of an alpha and a beta subunit of the four glycoprotein hormones gives a molecule with biological activity characteristics, characteristic of the hormone from which the beta subunit is derived. 
So let's look at something a little more clinical and a little more exciting. Okay. Before five weeks age of gestation, HCG is expressed in both the syncytial trophoblast and the cytotrophoblast. So time and again, we'll keep repeating, where are these hormones produced? In your trophoblasts. Later, when maternal serum levels peak, HCG is produced almost solely in the syncytial trophoblasts. At this time, mRNA concentrations of the alpha and the beta subunits in the syncytial trophoblasts are greater than a term. This may be an important consideration when HCG is used as a screening procedure to identify abnormal fetuses. By the time the woman has reached approximately 36 weeks age of gestation, they account for 30 to 50 percent. The alpha subunits account for 30 to 50 percent of the hormone. Okay, thus alpha HCG secretion roughly corresponds to placental mass, where a secretion of the complete HCG molecules is maximal at eight to ten weeks. So let's look at HCG concentrations in the serum as contrasted or compared to HCG concentrations in the urine. HCG is detectable in the plasma of pregnant women within seven to nine days after the mid-cycle surge of LH. So if you remember, when does LH surge? Mid-cycle. And so this HCG increase um, that precedes um, of, uh, sorry, the, the detection of HCG after the mid-cycle surge that precedes ovulation may also roughly correlate to its detection in the serum by approximately eight days after conception. It is likely that HCG mat enters maternal blood at the time of blastocyst implantation. Plasma levels increase rapidly, doubling every two days, with maximal levels reached at about 8 to 10 weeks age of gestation, where if quantitative measurements were done, you would have about 100,000 milli-IU per liter. From then, HCG levels plateau and begin to decrease to about 10 to 20,000 milli-IU per liter by the time the woman has reached 18 to 20 weeks. Plasma levels are maintained at this lower level for the remainder of the pregnancy. By the end of the first trimester, the placenta itself produces enough progesterone to support the pregnancy. HCG concentrations in the urine roughly mirror that of the maternal plasma. So maternal urine contains the same variety of HCG degradation products as maternal plasma. The principal urinary form of HCG in the urine is the beta core fragment. And so this is what goes into your pregnancy test kits via urine test. Similarly, if urine were to be used as the method of determining HCG levels, this would also peak at about eight to 10 weeks age of gestation. So it is a so-called beta subunit antibody, which is used in most pregnancy tests because it reacts with both intact HCG. How is HCG regulated? Placental gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or your GNRH, is likely involved in the regulation of HCG formation. Both GNRH and its receptor are expressed by cytotrophoblasts and by the syncytial trophoblasts. GNRH administration elevates circulating HCG levels and cultured trophoblasts respond to GNRH treatment and actually raise HCG secretion. Pituitary GNRH production also is regulated by inhibin and activin, peptide hormones we will discuss briefly later. Clearance of HCG is via the kidneys and liver. What are the biologic functions of HCG? because they all interact to really maintain the pregnancy. But let's go into the more specific roles for H beta HCG, oh, sorry, for your HCG. Both HCG subunits are required for binding to the LH HCG receptor in the corpus luteum and the fetal testis. 
LHHG receptors are present in a variety of tissues, but their role there is less defined. The best known biological function of HCG is the so-called rescue and maintenance of the corpus luteum. This equates to continued progesterone production. So just as a review, remember that earlier we mentioned that in the early part of pregnancy, progesterone, also produced by the corpus luteum, becomes now transferred to a function of the placenta. And so this interface is aided also by the presence of your HCG. Bradbury and colleagues found that progesterone producing lifespan of a corpus luteum of menstruation could be prolonged for two weeks actually by, beta, by HCG administration. It is also known that HCG stimulates fetal testicular testosterone secretion, which is maximum approximately when peak levels of HCG are attained, thus at a critical time in sexual differentiation of the male fetus, HCG enters the fetal plasma from the syncytial trophoblasts. In the fetus, it acts as an LH surrogate to stimulate replication of Leydig cells and testosterone synthesis to promote male sexual differentiation. Before about 110 days, there is no vascularization of the fetal anterior pituitary from the hypothalamus. Thus, there is little pituitary LH secretion and HCG acts as LH before this time. So what is 110 days? That would translate to approximately 14 to 16 weeks age of gestation. The maternal thyroid gland is also stimulated by large quantities of your HCG. In some women with gestational trophoblastic disease, biochemical and clinical evidence of hyperthyroidism sometimes develop. This once was attributed to formation of chorionic thyrotropines by neoplastic trophoblasts. However, it was subsequently shown that some forms of HCG bind to TSH receptors on thyrocytes because as I mentioned, there is some similar structural um, compatible, uh, there is structural similarity between hormones such as your HCG, your LH, and your thyroid hormones. Finally, the LH-HCG receptor is expressed by thyrocytes, which suggests that HCG th stimulates thyroid activity via this receptor and via the TSH receptor. Other HCG functions include the promotion of relaxine secretion by the corpus luteum, LHHCG receptors have also been found in the myometrium and in uterine vascular tissue. Thus, it has been hypothesized that HCG may act to promote uterine vascular vasodilation and myometrial smooth muscle relaxation. Relatively higher HCG levels may be found at mid trimester in women carrying a fetus with Down syndrome an observation used in biochemical screening tests. It has also been shown to be at high levels in women carrying multifetal gestations, in women having erythroblastosis fetalis associated with fetal hemolytic anemia, and in women with gestational trophoblastic disease. In contrast, lower HCG plasma levels have been associated with abortions, ectopic pregnancies, or in general, what we would call first trimester losses. At a level of approximately 1,000 to 1,500 milli international units per milliliter, a gestational sac should be seen in most pregnancies. Let's move on to another peptide hormone. This is now the human placental lactogen or HPL. It has been called human chorionic somatomammotropin or the chorionic growth hormone. Maybe for the purposes of pronunciation, it seems easier to say human placental lactogen. Because of its potent lactogenic acid growth hormone-like bioactivity and immunochemical resemblance to the human growth hormone, this is why it has been shown, uh, it has been used, the terms have been used interchangeably. But at the present time, we would prefer to call it the human placental lactogen. 
prolactin-like activity in the human placenta was first described as far back as 1936. The responsible protein was isolated from placental extracts and retroplacental blood. Again, because of its potent lactogenic and growth hormone-like activity, it was known then as chorionic growth hormone. Also now, also previously referred as chorionic somatomomotropin. The term human placenta lactogen is used by most, and it has been shown that this hormone, like your HCG, was concentrated in your syncytiotrophoblasts. It is a single chain polypeptide consisting of 191 amino acids, slightly bigger than other hormones, with a molecular weight of 22,279 daltons that will not appear in the exam. It has a short half-life, only about 15 minutes. The production rate of HPL near term, which is approximately one gram per day, is by far though the greatest of any known hormone among humans or in humans. They say also that because the HPL is structurally similar to human prolactin, it, is, it has been suggested that the genes for HPL or your human H or your human um, uh, yeah, your human placental lactogen, um, your human prolactin, and your human chorionic growth hormone all evolved from a common ancestral gene, probably that for prolactin, by repeated gene duplication. What do HPL concentrations in the serum? look like. HPL is demonstrable in the placenta within 5 to 10 days after conception is, and is detected in maternal serum as early as 3 weeks. The reason we don't normally do this in clinical practice is because there is no clinical bearing, right? Unless we wanted to determine whether it is compatible with a viable pregnancy or not, HCG is more readily available as a commercial test. Maternal plasma concentrations of HPL are linked to placental mass, and they rise steadily until 34 to 36 weeks, age of gestation. Serum concentrations reach levels in late pregnancy of 5 to 15 grams per milliliter, higher than any other protein hormone, as mentioned in the slide earlier. Other biologic functions of human placental lactogen include the following. It promotes maternal lipolysis with increased levels of circulating free, at, free fatty acids. And this is very important because this lipolysis now becomes the source of energy, not only for maternal metabolism, but for fetal metabolism and nutrition as well. It is said to have anti-insulin or diabetogenic action that leads to increased maternal insulin levels. It favors protein synthesis and provides a readily available source of amino acids to the fetus. It also serves as a potent angiogenic hormone, playing an incru a cru crucial role in the formation of fetal vasculature. In the mother, HPL stimulates insulin secretion and your insulin growth factor one production. It also induces insulin resistance and carbohydrate intolerance. As mentioned earlier, they mobilize lipids as free fatty acids for maternal metabolism and fetal nutrition and metabolism. In the fed state, there is abundant glucose available leading to increased insulin levels, lipogenesis, and glucose utilization. This is associated with decreased gluconeogenesis and a decrease in the circulating free fatty acids because the free fatty acids are now utilized in the process of lipogenes lipogenesis to deposit storage packets of triglycerides. So the graph on the left shows you the various stages at which HPL um, is utilized. As glucose decreases in the fasting state, human placental lactogen levels rise. This stimulates lipolysis, leading to an increase in circulating free fatty acids. 
Thus, a different fuel is provided for the mother so that glucose and amino acids can be conserved for the fetus. With sustained fasting, maternal fat is utilized for fuel to such an extent that maternal ketone levels rise. There is limited transport of free fatty acids across the placenta. Therefore, when glucose becomes scarce for the fetus, fetal tissues will now utilize those ketones that have crossed the placenta. Decreased glucose levels lead to decreased insulin and increased HPL, further increasing lipolysis and ketone levels. HPL may also enhance uptake of ketones and amino acids. The mechanism for the insulin antagonism by the HPL may be the HPL stimulated increase in free fatty acid levels, which in turn directly interfere with insulin directed entry of glucose into the cells. These interactions significantly evolve, involve growth factors, particularly your insulin like growth factor at the cellular level. This mechanism can be viewed as an important means to provide fuel for the fetus between maternal meals. However, if there is a sustained state of inadequate glucose intake, intake sorry, if there is a sustained state of inadequate glucose intake, such as, for example, the mother starves herself for whatever reason or it is inability to feed on time, the subsequent ketosis may actually impair fetal brain development and function. Pregnancy is not the time to severely restrict caloric intake. Indeed, impaired fetal growth and development are now recognized to correlate with adverse cardiovascular risk factors and disease in adult life. And so that's where we're seeing that things that take place in the fetal state may impact in future years. Looking at another hormone, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone or your GNRH. It has its highest expression during the first trimester. It is found in cytotrophoblasts, but in contrast to the other hormones we learned about earlier, not in the syncytiotrophoblasts. Placental-derived GnRH functions to regulate trophoblast HCG production, and hence the observation, as I mentioned earlier, that GnRH levels may be higher early in pregnancy. For each of the known hypothalamic releasing or inhibiting hormones, such as your GnRH, your TRH, your, GR, your CRH, your somatostatin, there is analogous hormone production in the human placenta. And many investigators have proposed that this is indicative of a hierarchy of control in the synthesis of your chorionic tropic agents. There's a reasonably large amount of immunoreactive GnRH in the placenta. It has been demonstrated that human placenta could synthesize both GnRH and TRH in vitro. Placenta-derived GnRH functions to regulate trophoblast Gn HCG production, as mentioned. Placenta-derived GnRH is also the likely cause of elevated maternal GnRH levels in pregnancy if one were to take serum levels of this hormone. Moving on to another peptide hormone, your corticotropin-releasing hormone, or your CRH. It is said to increase by as much as 100 times that of the non-pregnant state, particularly during the late third trimester. It is identical in structure to your hypothalamic CRH and is produced in the trophoblast, the fetal membranes, and the decidua. It acts to increase placental ACTH secretion. Glucocorticoids stimulate placental CRH production, but inhibits hypothalamic CRH. It plays a role in the induction of smooth muscle relaxation in vascular and myometrial tissue and immunosuppression. CRH receptors are present in many tissues, the placenta, adrenal gland, sympathetic ganglia, lymphocytes, gastrointestinal tract, gonads, and myometrium. Both CRH and another hormone known as urocortin increase trophoblast ACTH secretion as in the third bullet, supporting an autocrine 
paracrine role. Remember, earlier we mentioned the placenta in itself cannot act alone, but acts through hormones, the autocrine paracrine function. Large amounts of your CRH from trophoblast enter maternal blood, but there's also a large concentration of specific CRH binding proteins in maternal plasma. And the bound CRH is what seems to be biologically inactive. The other proposed biological roles include, as mentioned, the induction of smooth muscle relaxation. The physiological reverse, however, induction of myometrial contractions has been proposed for the rising levels of CRH seen near the end of gestation. One hypothesis is that CRH may be involved with parturition initiation, such as that in those who may have idiopathic preterm labor, where a more rapid increase in maternal CRH levels have been seen. In women with idiopathic preterm labor, the rapid increase in maternal CRH concentrations has led to the hypothesis that placental CRH may actually be a chief determinant of the length of gestation or what is called the placental clock. CRH secreted into the fetal circulation may, derive, may drive increased cortisol production, maturation of the fetal lung, and increased surfactant production. Moving on to another hormone, the growth hormone variant. It is a growth hormone that is not expressed in the pituitary. It is sometimes referred to the placental growth hormone. It has growth promoting and anti-lipogenic functions similar to your HGH. It is present in maternal plasma by 21 to 26 weeks, increasing quite rapidly but just steadily until approximately 36 weeks and it remains relatively constant thereafter. In animal studies, overexpression of the HGHV has caused severe insulin resistance and thus it is a likely candidate to mediate insulin resistance of pregnancy. Later on in your other modules, you will learn about insulin resistance during pregnancy being the contributory factor for the predisposition to gestational diabetes mellitus. And so this hormone is said to probably play a role. There are other pituitary-like hormones secreted by the placenta. Relaxin, its expression has been demonstrated in human corpus luteum, decidua, and placenta. It is structurally similar to insulin and to the insulin-like growth factor. The rise in maternal circulating relaxin levels seen in early pregnancy is attributed to secretion by the corpus luteum and levels parallel those seen for HCG. It has been proposed that relaxin, along with rising progesterone levels, acts on the myometrium to promote relaxation and quiescence observed in early pregnancy. In addition, the production of relaxin and relaxin-like factors within the placenta and fetal membranes is believed to play an important autocrine, paracrine role in the postpartum regulation of the extracellular matrix degradation. Other pituitary-like hormones, your parathyroid hormone-related protein, PTHRP. Circulating levels of PTHRP are significantly elevated in pregnancy within the maternal but not in the fetal circulation. Although not clear, many potential functions of this hormone have been proposed. PTHRP synthesis is found in several normal adult tissues, especially in reproductive organs that include the myometrium, the endometrium, corpus luteum, and lactating mammary tissue. PTHRP is not produced in the parathyroid glands of normal adults. Placenta-derived PTHRP may have an important autocrine paracrine role within the fetal maternal unit as well as on the adjacent myometrium. It may activate trophoblast receptors to promote calcium transport for fetal bone growth and ossification. Another peptide hormone, the chorionic adrenocorticotropin, or what we call placental ACTH, although its physiological role is not clear. 
Placental ACTH is secreted into both the maternal and fetal circulations, but maternal ACTH is not transported to the fetus. The placental ACTH is not under feedback regulation by glucocorticoids, which may explain why there is maternal partial resistance to dexamethasone suppression. Placental corticotropin releasing hormone stimulates synthesis and release of your chorionic ACTH. Placental CRH production is positively regulated by cortisol, producing what is called a novel positive feedback loop. And this system is important for controlling fetal lung maturation and timing of parturition. Moving on to your other placental peptide hormones, insulin-like growth factors, IGFs. So you may be familiar with this from your organ system uh, learnings, but in terms of placental endocrinology and how it plays a role in pregnancy, it is very important in the role of uh, maintaining normal placental pregnancy physiology and for fetal growth regulation. It has a very complex signaling pathway involving several ligands, receptors, and IGF binding proteins. The IGF-2 is a predominant growth factor that binds to the IGF-1 receptor to initiate a signaling cascade that induces cellular proliferation, affecting and impacting fetal survival and fetal growth. And it is said that fetal growth is a complex process governed by multiple genetic factors, including the insulin-like growth factors. Okay, aside from other external environmental processes, but they say that IGF may be contributory in the sense that there may be idiopathic cases of intrauterine growth restriction, which are caused by subtle alterations in the IGF axis, including heterozygotic mutations, polymorphisms, and epigenetic regulation. And then we have the other growth factors, your vascular endothelial growth factor, or what we will call VEGF, and your placental growth factor, known as your PIGF. These act via two receptors, your VEGFR1 and your VEGFR2, which are found in the villus vascular endothelium. They are highly specific for endothelial cells. The important take-home point when it comes to VEGF and your PIGF is that in hypoxic states in the fetus or in the mother that can cause hypoxic states that in the fetus, hypoxia may now stimulate production of your VEGF, VEGF and a soluble binding protein, the SFLT1. The PIGF acts via the FLT1 in non-branching angiogenesis in the last trimester of pregnancy, and expression is down-regulated by hypoxia, suggesting that oxygen tension may regulate the balance between VEGF and PIGF, and thus effects may be seen consequently in the fetus. A less studied um, hormone, the leptin, are secreted normally by the adipocytes. It functions as an anti-obesity hormone that decreases food intake through its hypothalamic receptor. It's all, it also regulates bone growth and immune function. During pregnancy, leptin is synthesized by the cytotrophoblast and by the syncytiotrophoblast. And they correlate positively with birth weight, similar to our insulin growth factor, to our VEGFs. Relative contributions of leptin from maternal adipose tissues suggest that in contrast to that derived from the placenta, the functions may not be as well defined. Maternal serum levels are significantly higher than those in non-pregnant women fetal leptin levels are correlated positively with birth weight and likely play an important role in fetal development and growth. Recent studies also suggest that leptin inhibits apoptosis or programmed cell death and promotes trophoblastic proliferation. Neuropeptide Y is synthesized in the cytotrophoblast. 
This 36 amino acid peptide is widely distributed in the brain. It is also found in sympathetic neurons innervating the cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, and genitourinary systems. Neuropeptide Y has been isolated from the placenta in, and localized in cytotrophoblast. There are receptors for the neuropeptide Y and trophoblast and treatment of placental cells with neuropeptide Y causes CRH release. And so that's where probably the main function of neuropeptide Y, how it correlates or also, um, works alongside your CRH hormone. And so we're towards the end of our discourse with two other hormones, your inhibin and activin. Inhibin is a glycoprotein hormone that acts preferentially to inhibit pituitary follicle stimulating hormone release. It acts in concert with large amounts of sex steroid hormones to inhibit FSH secretion and thereby inhibit ovulation during pregnancy. It may also act via your GNRH to regulate placental HCG synthesis. Activin is not detectable in fetal blood before labor, but is present in umbilical cord blood after labor begins. It has been shown that serum activin A in particular, the levels of serum activin A decline rapidly after delivery. And if one were to look at all the hormones that have been produced in great quantities during pregnancy, Soon after delivery, in the immediate postpartum, in the immediate porperium, these levels drop very dramatically. So in the past um, 45 minutes or so, I hope that I have been able to impart to you the role of the different steroid hormones and the different peptide hormones at the placental interface that act synergistically to be able to ensure maintenance, sustenance of a pregnancy that will reach term. Okay. For the references, most of my um, slides were taken from the 25th edition of William and the 8th edition of Spiroff. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>